Today we're going to talk about logging trailers and all the modifications I had to make to this trailer over the years so that I could haul heavy logs into my sawmill. Over the years I've had problems about loading this kind of log or that and or that big a log and so forth. Uh, and then each time I had that problem I have modified this trailer. So this trailer has been through like eight modifications now and I'm going to go over those with you and show you why I made each one of them. They were lessons learned in life. Logging trailer. It'll also go over a lot of safety issues with logging trailers and winches and batteries and tires and things that will really matter for your safety and when you're out using these logging trailers. So stick with me. We'll show you how it's done. The uh, first lesson I learned about logging trailers was I went out to uh, just down the road here and uh, loaded a log and it wasn't all 18 inches diameter and 12 feet long or so but of course it weighed over a thousand pounds and I had this idea I'd just take my trailer down there and use a hand crank cable winch to, just to put it on our come along what a lot of people call them. And the time I had cranked that log on that trailer and had to do all the stuff, I realized real soon that a hand cranked wrench winch was not gonna get it. So that's when I started putting electric winches on this trailer. As I added electric winches, first thing you run into with a, a winch is there's a rule, and, and this is, believe me, this is a concrete rule. The log will never, never go on the stra trailer straight. It will always get crooked, try to roll over, jackknife, it'll do anything but try to come right on the trailer for you. That just don't happen. So first I start off with one winch. And that one winch, I'd start pulling and the log would get crooked and then I'd try to get a PV or a crowbar and straighten it out and that just don't work. So I come up with this idea and I added two inches where I could use another winch to straighten out the log. And as I loaded bigger and bigger logs, I realized that uh, that didn't work really well either. You've got to pull with one winch, which is this center winch back here. And then as the log, st you start to realize which way the log is gonna go, you use these winches with snatch blocks off the back of the trailer to stabilize it and hold it and guide it on there properly and that method has worked pretty good and in several of my videos you'll see me loading logs and using that method of pulling with one winch and using two to hold it straight or keep it from rolling and so forth so three winch winches worked then I ran into another problem it's fine when you're loading little logs this big around because if you mount your winches down here like a lot of people do the, the worst thing you can do is mount them plumb down there they're too low but some people will try to mount them right here. Well, if I'm loading logs that big, that'll work. But when I start loading logs that are three foot diameter, the winch is lower, the log setting up here, but the winch is down here. So as you pull it up here, the cable is going up over the log. And so that's when I come in here and my welder buddy, I had him weld this I-beam on the trailer. And what this I-beam does is raised up and it is really enforced with some really heavy material. And then my three winches are mounted on it. Now, it would take over a four foot log for the cable to get into the winch. Not that I don't do four foot logs. But uh, anyway, this was a big modification, added a lot to the tongue weight was one of the issues. As I got three winches on here, I started off with one battery about an 830 amp hour battery or cold cranking amp battery. And first thing I noticed, logs this big, yeah, you can load it with one battery. When I started doing bigger logs, wouldn't do it, so I added two batteries. And I have you tried to do two batteries for a few years. Now I'm doing logs three and four foot diameter and that is just inadequate. Just not enough, even though those are 830, cold cranking amps I think something along that line uh, two of them is just not enough so uh, this is my latest modification I had my welder buddy build this shelf and I've added two batteries here that are 1140 amp hours or crank cold cranking amps so now I literally have four batteries driving my winches 
and it's made a huge difference. Uh, the video I released for this one of a 38 inch pine tree thing just skidded right up on the trailer with this configuration. So if you're gonna get a trailer and if you're gonna use winches on it, depending on the size of log you're loading, if you're just loading little logs, it's not that big a deal to set up a trailer. But when you start loading massive big logs, you need a lot of battery to drive these winches. And the other thing you gotta constantly keep in mind is these winches get hot when they're just sitting there just pulling, 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 a, you know, an eight or 9,000 pound log, they overheat. So you just have to really make yourself keep in mind that uh, these uh, logs, are, these winches are gonna get hot on you and you just have to stop, take a break. You know, one of the things the manufacturer says is, is use it uh, uh, about five minutes and let it rest 15. Uh, well, you'd never get anything done, but so we, we push that a little bit. But about every five minutes of cranking and pulling, you need to just stop and let your batteries kind of level out and recharge and cool, and then your winches cool. Otherwise, you'll end up replacing some of them. Uh, the batteries that I have had to replace, I've really had to replace because I got them too hot and the, and the plates separated. And uh, then they wouldn't hold a charge. So I've had to replace, this is like the third set of those batteries. Notice these batteries are much smaller. That's the original batteries. But I found out these bigger batteries are uh, much more suited to these winches. Now, what these batteries are is the kind you'll find on an RV or a tractor and uh, they're designed to crank big diesel engines or on an RV where you go park and then you use water pumps and other things to take showers with and all. So they're designed to keep cranking out uh, amps for long periods of time. So this is definitely a better style of battery to use. I'm not gonna throw away two good batteries. When those burn up, I'll replace them with this. You might have noticed I had to replace this wood that these batteries set on here uh, about a month ago because it had rotted. Well, when I rebuilt my boxes, I built them where they can be expanded to hold these batteries when these batteries go bad. So we, we'll replace those when it's time. I recharge these batteries after I come back from a logging trip by just putting a battery charger on them and leaving it till it shows that it's fully charged all four of them. You might ask the question of why I don't try to recharge the batteries out in the field by maybe hooking electric wires up from my truck battery and the alternator back into the trailer. I've had several offers from friends that are mechanics to do that for me and and I, my big objection to it is is if I get out somewhere and I run down the batteries on this trailer I certainly don't want to start hooking my truck to it and run down the batteries on my truck and then I'm out in the middle of some rural area in the middle of nowhere and I can't crank my truck. Uh, I'd like to at least come home if the batteries go dead on my trailer. So I reserve my battery in my truck just for that. So I do not hook my truck up to these trailer batteries. I just charge them at home, which is another reason you need more than one or two batteries. Uh, that just one or two batteries a lot of time on big logs will just run dead before you get through with the job. So far I've talked with you about battery size that you need for your winches. I've talked about winch size and what you need there. Another big part of your uh, loading ability has to do with how much of that battery power gets delivered to the winches. For example, here's one of my upgrades. This is common automotive battery cables. This is what I had on these two batteries on the bottom running electricity from one to the other. This is number six gauge wire. These things would get so hot that they just melt the insulation off of them when I'd use these winches. They're totally inadequate automotive cables are to what we're doing. What I have done is I've redone my trailer and so I went from number six wire to number one wire, one gauge wire on this trailer. 
You could even go bigger than that, but I would not have anything less than one gauge wire connecting these batteries together. Here's your problem, is if you go to these battery charts that you can find, they're all for automotive, talking about going from a battery to cranking a starter on an engine. There is no relation and no tables that I can find that talks about these batteries and these cables putting a, enough voltage and amperage to these winches for a constant pull where you're using a 12,000 pound winch to, to winch in a 10,000 pound log. There is no tables or nothing that you can find that guides you or directs you for that use. So it's, I'm giving you my level of experience here that common automotive cables that they say is just fine for cranking a diesel truck is not even close to adequate for running these big winches. Now there's a chart here showing what's on the internet. Take it with a grain of salt. I'll have it up my video, but I'll have it at the end of it so that you can sit and study it a little while. Remember, it is related to automotive stuff, not winches. These one gauge wires have made a huge difference, but uh, be sure and change those out. Now, this is two batteries here. They're wired in parallel, meaning I got two 12 volt batteries and what comes out of them is 12 volt. If you wire them in series, what you take is those two batteries would be 24 volts. That's not what we want for our winches. You'll burn them up if you wire them that way. You want it parallel and they come up and they parallel to these winches above. And so I've got four batteries but because they're wired in parallel, there's only 12 volts going to these winches. But the amperage is adding up. 800, 800, 1100, 1100 amps are available to this winch. This is why now I can pull huge logs on here without this thing hesitating. Has to do with you moving that electricity through those cables. It takes large cables, not these little dinky ones that comes on automotive equipment. So keep that in mind, study the chart. The other thing that, uh, just for safety reasons, this has a two and five eighths inch ball on it, bumper hitch. Gooseneck trailers are good, just a lot of trouble to put on and off is the biggest problem with a gooseneck trailer. Not that it isn't safe, it is very safe. So two and five eighths inch ball. Now notice my bright color here. When you're backing up <laughs> loading a trailer, if all of this is black in your rear view camera, you can't hardly see this trailer hitch. So I, every once in a while I come out here and put some kind of fluorescent paint on it, that helps me find the trailer hitch when I'm uh, backing up. So lock it up, and of course it's gotta have some big safety chains on it. This is a new modification. This is an electric jack that'll jack the front of the uh, trailer up and down. And the reason it is, is when I added this shelf, I couldn't reach the crank up under here. It was up under this box. And since I'm getting older, you know, I just went ahead and bought me one of these things. Now this thing's supposed to lift 5,000 pounds. Now if you listen to it, it kind of works because there is a lot of weight between this steel beam three winches, four batteries, this tongue weight is heavy. It's pretty heavy. Um, this thing started out that the trailer weighed about 5,000 pounds. Well, I've added a good 1,500, maybe even 2,000 pounds of weight to this trailer. So uh, the tongue weight on it is much heavier than a, a normal trailer, but the, the heavier duty, I, I bought this at but Northern Tool and uh, they had two ratings of it, a lightweight one and this 5,000 pound one. So I bought it and it's worked well so far. I've had about a month, so I'm still getting used to it. That's what the front of the trailer looks like and why it's all modified. Now remember, if you decide to do this beam on here, it cannot be a lightweight beam because this, this is a 12,000 pound winch. This is a 17,500 pound winch. When you're pulling that much, uh, pressure on this thing, you better have that thing mounted to something that ain't gonna move. So that's why this thing is welded up so sturdy. Is yes, I've never had an issue with it. This configuration with this beam and all has been on here six years now. Hadn't had any problem whatsoever with it.
you, you might ask how long these winches will last with this use. This is the first winch I bought. That winch right there is going on, I think, nearly 10 years old. Still works great. I've replaced the cable on it three or four times. Cables don't last that long, you have to replace them. Uh, so it's an old winch and it's still working good. I replaced that one over there last year. So it's new. I've had this winch, a 17,000 pound winch, about five years and it's still functioning all right. Now, some of the mechanics with winches. Winches pull real strong, but the rating, uh, this is a 12,000 pound rated winch. You gotta understand, it only is pulling 12,000 pounds when it is on the bottom roll of your drum. Once this cable starts coming up and it goes the second layer and then the third layer of cable, it pulls less and less, about half of what it does or what it's rated for. This chart will be available at the very end of this video to study farther, but some things you really need to pay attention to on the thing. And one of them is uh, the line pull rating, depending on how many layers of cable are on your winch and what it'll pull it drops off drastically. So quite often you'll see me on these videos where I'll take these winches and I'll bring them way out and double them, bring them back and put a snatch block on it. Well, what I'm doing is I'm getting this down to the bare minimum and so it pulls more. I do that a lot on this one because this is where I'll pull my nine or 10,000 pound logs on the trailer. And quite often I'll pull that uh, cable off all the way, put a snatch block on it and run the cable all the way back up here so that you're doubling. If you, you remember your math class from school, when you double a cable, you know, you, you half the pressure it takes to move something. So that helps you pull these big loads on here by doing that. So just keep in mind that there's a lot of mechanical stuff you have to kind of keep in your mind as you pull big loads up. I will tell you from experience that if you're going to run a logging trailer and load heavy logs, you have to have a minimum of a 12,000 pound winch. Anything less than that, you're just wasting your time. You'll spend more time trying to make it work than you can working. So anyway, this old winch is still functioning, but as you can see from the rust on the cable and all, it's about time I change that cable out on that one. So it's getting springtime and we'll be going getting some, cutting some trees and getting some logs here soon. So I need to do that pretty quick, change that out. One problem with winches is they will sell you this winch and they sell you a little controller to control this winch. And you can buy wireless controllers. A wireless controller or a hand controller in my use is good for about six months. And the problem is the original controller for these, any of these three winches, once it burns up, you can't buy a second controller for them. You know, I, I don't understand. The, the controllers are a very short life thing. They burn up, they go bad. Why can you not buy a second one for your winch? Because that's the first thing that's gonna go bad on your winch is the dang controller. Now, Harbor Freight has started handling a remote one that it can also be a landline one where it's hooked up direct. The problem is I can put, put that over here, but if I bought two of those uh, wireless ones, I can't have two of them because they're both the same frequency. There's, there's no method to change where you got two different frequencies running. So in other words, if I put two remote uh, controllers on these winches and I push the button, both winches turn on. Uh, you, you can't operate like that. You need a controller for each winch because the winches are used at various rates. So anyway, uh, I have used, uh, sometimes you'll see me having to move things around controllers and all just to get it. This one here, I literally took a, a trailer lights cable and redone it to where it would uh, connect up because the first thing that fried up was the connector on the thing. So. That's the biggest downfall of winches is the controllers go out fairly quick and you have to do some kind of modification or buy some other equipment. The original manufacturer's not furnishing them. I don't know why. But anyway, the winches are lasting a long time and they're being good, so no problem there. 
This is another major modification I made to this trailer. Used to have a wooden floor in it when I bought it. And uh, so I used it for a number of years. Uh, two problems with a wooden floor is one is it's got a lot of friction. So when you're dragging a log, it's making these winches work harder to, to pull across a wooden floor. The other is the, the log sometimes will dig splinters out of the thing. So you end up with grooves all in your wood floor because the, the way the wall, log will pull wood fibers out. So what made this modification necessary though is I went over here to Commerce, Texas, and I loaded a four foot diameter water rope log. And the log wasn't but about 12 feet long. But what it done is it come up my ramp back here, which we'll show you more later. It come up the ramp, but when it flipped over, it went through the floor of the trailer. Wooden floors can't stand that kind of impact. So the log busted the trailer floor out. So I took this trailer over to my buddy Richard and uh, he ripped all the wood flooring out of it and put extra I-beams across this back portion that was gonna get extra shocks. So they're like double spaced I-beams under that floor. This is quarter inch steel plate and it's welded at the joints. Now the upside to it is it's slicker than wood, so I can, once the tra log's on the trailer, I can drag it easier. Uh, downside to it is that's 760 pounds of steel I've added to the weight of this trailer. But it's quarter inch steel. I've had it on there now about five years. And as you see, it's not dented or anything. Sometimes these joints where the sheets meet will uh, come unwelded because just the stresses, but uh, Richard used to tax them when I go over there for repairs and uh, get it back to where the logs will slide up here on it. So we replaced the trailer floor because the log went through it. <laughs> so I learned my lesson. <laughs> and so many of these modifications on this trailer come about because of we were just using it and then it would uh, something would go wrong. And so all the modifications were to correct problems like that. Now you'll see in one of the pictures where this thing hadn't got a tailgate on it. Well, how do I keep everything from falling out of it? Well, I take this winch cable and it goes around one of the things and that steel ramp lays on there and I pull it tight with this and now I got a tailgate using my steel ramp to hold things on. Now, I'll talk here in a minute about, but you see all this hardware laying on the trailer. That's just a small part of it. There's a whole pallet full of other hardware. When you go out to pull down trees, especially problem trees that's trying to fall on a house or something and takes a lot of uh, winching and guidance and stuff, I may have all of this stuff out there rigged up. You, you just can't have enough snatch blocks and, and uh, clevises and chains and uh, chokers. Uh, all kinds of tools, you just, it's amazing how many you can go through doing a simple pull it down a tree job and then loading it, cutting it up, loading it. So, uh, it takes a lot of them, different sizes. What you're seeing right here is uh, just some of the snatch, snatch blocks and chokers and clevises and chains and various things, and a lot of wooden blocks. When these logs get on here, if they're a perfectly round log, they're gonna roll. So you'll see those logs rolling from side to side and that's why I have to have blocks on here to chalk them up. What you'll see here is this trailer is equipped with 10 ply tires. That's the way it comes from the factory. I have blowed out at least a half dozen of them over the years because these E-rated tires are only good for like 3,400 pounds a tire. Well, often I'll have quite a bit more weight than these things are rated at on the trailer. So I blowed out more than my share of tires. One of the lessons I have learned from that experience is two things, is once that tire goes down, you can't get a jack under that axle. Once the tire goes flat, the axle is so low the ground, your little bottle jacks, even if it's a big bottle jack, will not go under the axle. So you can't lift the trailer. 
So the method I've come to changing tires that I blow out is in the back of my truck under the toolbox, I have these six inch, made from a six inch piece of wood, but it's a wedge. I lay that wedge down and then a six inch block in front of it and I'll pull the trailer up on it, even with a flat tire. But what that does is get the trailer tire up higher enough that now you can get you a jack under there and jack it up the rest of the way and change that tire. So think about if you blow out a tire, how are you going to go about changing it, especially if you got a load of logs on here. And that's usually when it always blows out is when you got a heavy load of logs on here. I go long distances sometimes to pick up logs and cut trees. And the lesson I've learned is if I got a load of logs and I blow out a tire, how much farther can I make it down the road before I blow out another tire? So I have started carrying two spare tires. And that just takes care of that issue. If I'm 100 miles from here with a trailer load of, of logs and I'm out, a lot of, I'm out in the rural areas where there is no uh, AAA or somebody to come by and fix your flat for you. If you blow out a tire, you're in trouble. You don't carry your spares with you. So I carry two spare tires with it. Now, next time I upgrade my trailer and I'm waiting for these tires to wear down, I have done some research and I figured out that these tires are just really not strong enough for the work I am now doing, loading three and four foot diameter logs on here. So therefore what I'm gonna be doing uh, when I replace these is these are 10 ply tires. I'm probably gonna be going up to an H or J rated tire, which is around 18 to 20 ply tires to put on there. They're more expensive, but they're also designed, these things are designed for like 3,400 pounds of uh, weight per tire. And uh, a J uh, rated tires were rated around 6,000 pounds. So nearly double what this one is. So that should get me by when I change the tires out. Keep in mind, little old two ply tires that uh, you might have on a trailer ain't gonna do you service when you start loading big logs. If all you're loading little ones, you may be all right, but it's worth checking into that to see if you meet the uh, standards that you're supposed to have on a trailer. How I ended up with this trailer particularly, I didn't want a gooseneck because they're just too much trouble to, to hook up and unhook. So I went and got a tongue trailer when I bought this, brand new trailer. And I went in and asked the salesman a question. And the question I asked him was, is, What's the biggest trailer you got that'll fit on my three quarter ton four wheel drive pickup that I pull this with that doesn't require a commercial license to pull here in Texas? Now, it may be different in different states, but I don't think it's much different. So I said, what's the heaviest, duties, biggest load GVW trailer that I can buy and not have to have a commercial license to pull it? Because if you get personal license, if you get a commercial license, you have to have then insurance to cover, commercial insurance to cover that. So um, this was the trailer. It's a 20 foot long trailer. It's eight feet wide and it has been more than adequate for nearly everything I've done with the exception I blowed out some tires by overloading it. So uh, that's something to consider. Now they make huge trailers dual wheel trailers, 25 feet long, gooseneck, not gooseneck, whatever you want. But keep in mind that you really are gonna have a problem. You run into a highway patrol out there uh, on that when you're, oh, you, he stops you and checks your license and find out you hadn't got a commercial driver's license. Uh, so could be an issue with you. Uh, one little thing I might mention <laughs> here in Texas, Y'all may not be aware of the history of Texas, especially far East Texas. At one point, they were cutting so much timber out here in far East Texas in old growth pine that 80% of the houses in America being built were built with East Texas pine. There's just so many pine trees out there and so much harvesting going on. So that all happened in the late 1880s to 1920s so, or, or thereabout. And what happened is those big timber companies got to have a lot of political influence down in Texas, uh, down in Austin and, and our capital down here. 
And then, of course, the oil boom hit, and all the oil guys got a lot of political influence because that's where the money was at back about the same period of time. So they uh, end up writing some laws that were very one-sided. <laughs> I'll, I'll call them one-sided. They were very advantageous to them. <laughs> and one of those things that they'd done in Texas to avoid paying really high taxes you can get an agricultural exemption for property that's more than 10 acres. And this allows you to pay lower taxes. It costs you $35 a year to do that, to, be, to get an agricultural exemption, no farmers. Well, the timber guys jumped on this and they wrote up a deal where you can get a timber exemption. It cost me $35 for two years to, to purchase a timber exemption. Now, who can qualify for that is only those folks that are going out and cutting raw timber and transporting it. Uh, once the lumber is cut up into, say, two by fours, two by sixes as a finished product and it's going to a retailer or a job site or something, you're not covered under that. So there's some little rules in there. But here's the deal. I can go cut all the trees I want. I can overload this trailer and they can't write me a ticket for overloading on the thing. Uh, one of the things is it, it, the fact that you have to have commercial license is somewhat foggy on these overloaded trailers or not because of this rule. But that little piece of paper that you need to keep in your vehicle for a timber exemption allows you to do a lot of things that uh, most folks can't because, and this is just an old law that nobody's ever changed, but it's still quite... Uh, in your favor for having a timber exemption with you. It's certainly worth the $35. So little note on that. This trailer come with two uh, ramps that's over in those pockets on each side of the trailer that you can hook up and I can load my John Deere tractor up on here using those ramps. They're vehicle loading ramps. But they're totally inadequate for loading eight, nine, ten thousand pound logs. So I had my welder buddy make this ramp. It is one heavy duty chunk of steel. I've been using this for about eight years now. It has not bent. It is not warped. It hadn't done nothing other than give me a hernia trying to lift the thing because it is exceptionally heavy. I'm going to guess around 150 pounds. It is just solid steel and he built it to my specifications, which that I could load eight or 10,000 pound logs and not bend it. So it works really well. And when I'm not using it, I slide it up here and hook that cable across here, and that's my tailgate. The uh, issue you got is it just weighs so dang much. I've, I've threatened a couple of times to go get, try to get a lunar one made that'll stand up to this. This has stood up to it and uh, been very good. But basically it works because you just hook your winches on your logs and they just hit this and slide right up on there and you're loaded. Now a couple of tricks. You will notice on some of my videos that I'm dragging logs for a long way with those winches before I load them. Why I'm doing that is like I'm backing up to a creek bank or something and sometimes they're higher and it'll make the back of this trailer jackknife up. So this thing may be four to six inches taller because the truck has went down uh, in the lay of the land. And that makes this steeper so when the log hits it, it gets harder to pull it up over the thing. So to compensate for that, I've come up with a way to offset that. And I was talking about these blocks. What I'll do is I'll back this trailer into more or less the position I'm gonna load the log. I'll put those blocks under the rear wheels of my truck and then I'll back up on top of them. Well, what that does is that raises my truck which lowers this. And now it's, it's a lot easier to load big logs because the, the tailgate's lower on the thing. So it works pretty good. Now. I've had several suggestions by a lot of folks that uh, we needed to build uh, a log arch, which is a big steel thing that supposedly is gonna lift this log. Log arches can work and be helpful on small trailers or short trailers is more precise, I guess, short trailers, because 
the log arch would be put close to the wheels of your trailer. For me to lift a log here, I'd have to move the log arch way back here. And then when I try to pick up a 10,000 pound log, I'm probably going to bend my trailer. Uh, it is just not the right thing for me with this 20 foot long trailer. Short trailers, small logs, certainly it can be helpful. So I haven't got a log arch. There's a second reason I don't have a log arch is, quite often I take this John Deere tractor here and load it up on here and go do things at other places, some of these farms and ranches. So if I had a log arch on here, I'd have to remove it, unbolt it, remove it every time I went to load my tractor on the trailer. So if you have a single use trailer and all you're using is carry small logs around, log arches may be all right. But for a big heavy duty trailer that you're gonna carry machinery on as well as logs and so forth and interchange those uses, uh, log arches is not a good deal. This is the best method. Now, one of the things I've learned to do is how to manipulate it. Remember, I'm 73 years old, so I'm not the, the strongest guy you ever met anymore like I used to be. But what I have figured out is two things. Is one, when I want to put the on there, if I get like this and get my elbows on my knees, I'm not gonna hurt my back when I lift this 150 pound thing. And then I don't really try to lift it high, just enough to slide on the trailer is what I'm gonna do. You just lift it, come up, lift it, come up. Now I'm gonna, that's half the thing. I'm gonna lift the other half. Shove it on there and it's loaded. And now I'll strap it down. So it's not that big an issue uh, to load and unload. The other thing is when I'm loading the tractor and stuff on here, I don't need this. And what I have figured out, put it back in place here. Put it back in place the same way. When I don't want it on the trailer, I gotta have some way of moving it out of the way. This works really well. You get it, you stand it up. And then you just get it and you just start walking it till it gets over here, wherever you're gonna store it at. I very rarely throw it flat on the ground. I usually lean it up against a tree or something because that's easier to get it back over here when I need to load it. Now, if I'm gonna load it again, let me show you another trick. All right, now we're gonna walk it back, same way. And rock it around and walk it. Notice there's a, a metal plate here. This rests on top of the trailer. This butts up against the trailer but there's a halfway piece of angle iron on this thing. Watch this. Let me get the right position here. If I go up like that to where this piece of angle iron is higher than the trailer, if I just let go with this, it's liable to spring up and bounce back. But watch this, I'm just gonna put my foot on it. It's loaded. So, over time I have learned how to manipulate all the equipment on this trailer and just do things by myself. So, it's heavy, no doubt. But, you know, you learn to work with your tools. What I want to show you here is this whole forklift pallet. I, uh, before I load my trailer when I'm going logging, I'll lift this up and drive up to the back of my pickup. And this blast black tub and the five yellow containers go in my pickup. Now the big tub has cables in it. Lots of cables. Sometimes I even have to load extra cables if I'm doing a long pull. So there's a lot of chokers in there and a lot of made up cables for various purposes. And so that goes with me because I never know exactly what I'm gonna need on a job so everything goes. Now these buckets 
One, I made up this wooden divider that the buckets set in in the back of my truck. And the reason that is, is if you just set the buckets in there, they touch each other and you can't get the lid open because one lid rubs, out, rubs on the other one. So this divider keeps them separated enough I can open the lids on these buckets. Now you might have noticed that I went to a lot of expense to get kitty litter buckets <laughs> that use. I got a buddy that's got cats and he brings me kitty litter buckets. Each one of them has a label on it. And inside there is a whole bunch of various equipment. Uh, snatch blocks and clevises and snatch blocks chains and then short chains. I have to attach all those snatch blocks on the trailer with something, so there's a lot of chains involved in doing that. I recently, thinking I had so many clevises, had to go buy, recently had to go buy some new clevises, four of them, because we got out on a big job and I used up every one of my head. You might think I have enough, but we used them all up. So all of this is going to go in a pickup bed so that I'm got any uh, this okay this thing has built up over a number of years what's in these buckets and what's in that tub and as i seen that i needed things i added them to this inventory so now when i go out i just carry it all with me because i never know what i'm going to run into and then i got it with me and i can usually make everything work and let me walk with the trade a lot of this stuff that was in those yellow tubs Oh, by the way, those uh, kitty litter tubs out in the sun, they're good for about one year and I have to replace them. You can see the lids are cracked and they're fading in color. The plastic doesn't hold up, but they work fairly well and they're free. So about once a year, I'll change those buckets out. I don't want to spend a minute talking to you about wire rope. That seems to be the, the preferred terminology for cable. On, uh, depending on the winch size you have and the load you're going to be pulling up the ramp with your winches, you need different types of cable. Now, one of the issues is these 12,000 pound winches come with a 3 8 cable on them. And both these outside winches, that's what they still got loaded on there. Uh, this center winch comes with a 7 16 cable on it and that's important because well, one there is a lot of wire rope and a lot of different ways you can twist the rope and put the fibers in it and it'll have different load links on it there's also when you go to charts on cables um, those charts are really rated for two things one if a crane is picking up a load they'll have one rating on the cable. But if you're dragging something with a cable, like in a tow-in situation, which is mostly what we do here, it, it, the table will be different for that cable. The rating will be on anything. But he, here's the deal. Uh, most 3 8 cable will uh, carry about 12,000 pounds is the uh, uh, minimum, bur uh, minimum bursting strength of the cable. So about 12,000 pounds. A 7 16 cable load jumps way on up to 16,000 pounds. So this right here is a half inch cable on this choker, which uh, is a really good idea, guys, because your chokers rub against the ground, the trees, the trailer, everything. They get a lot of wear and tear. You're better off if you've got a half inch cable for your choker. I try not to take the hook end of my winches and wrap it around the log and, and then pull with it because it ends up messing the end of the cable up. You, use a choker just so you don't destroy the end of your winch cables on the thing. But a half inch cable should be your minimum cable you're pulling stuff up on there with. Uh, sometimes I'll use those tongs and that's what these little special chains here are for that are short. And that's what these little special chains here are for. They're short, made up, and they're, they're made up to hook that, those tongs onto the cable here, make a link between them. And that's all those are used for. Uh, so if you use tongs, that's one thing. Half inch cable, 
when I'm doing big log, over 8,000 pounds, I use this 5 8 inch choker. If one, it's a lot longer. If you're doing huge logs, most likely they're bigger around than small logs. That, that may, say, may seem common knowledge, but, but here's the deal. When you start running that choker around it, you need a long choker to go around a three and a half, four foot diameter log. So you need it to have at least one choker that's long so that you can go all the way around it. Cause this little choker here is good for small logs, but it won't reach around a big log. So think about your cable. Here is some 7 16 cable I use a lot of times when I'm pulling down trees. It'll go between my heavy winch and the tree. Here is just common 3 8 cable that I sometimes will use as a second anchor point. Sometimes you need to support the whole tree with one cable, but then pull it over with another cable that doesn't take a lot of strength. So I'll use these cables where appropriate. The main thing I point I want to make to y'all on your winches is that all your winches, 12,000 pounds and above, should have at least a 7 16 cable on it. The problem you run into on these winches is the drum is so small that if you start putting 7 16 inch cable on it, it fills the drum up. But that winch costs twice what this winch costs. And it's got a bigger drum on it for a bigger cable. But there's a trade-off. So that's why I still have these smaller cables, because mostly I use these two side winches to jockey the log. The middle one does is the workhorse. It pulls heavy loads and it's cabled in accordance with that need on the thing. So study this chart that will be in at the end of this video and make some wise choices on the cables you buy for your winches. Uh, you can see there's three chokers left on the trailer here from the last time we was out logging. Snatch blocks. Make sure when you buy a snatch block, you don't buy the cheap ones. You need to buy some that uh, has a least 10,000 pound rating, but I prefer to buy the ones that have a 20,000 pound rating. I've never had one of them break, never had it come apart. So it's been a good investment. Let me move this camera out of the way. There's a PV. Sometimes on smaller logs, I'll need it. And then you got a, a set of hooks that sometimes I'll load smaller logs with. To those will stretch to 32 inches, but quite often I'll load logs so big that uh, those won't go on there, so I'll have to use these big chokers as I have. More chains, and there's a whole bunch of clevises, but that wasn't enough clevises to do that last job. It took so many of them. And then special made up chains right there to lift various things. So, as you can see, it's uh, a lot of things have been changed on this trailer. And I want to point out this. Can you see those lower batteries on there, right in front of the blocks? Uh, one of the things I need to do pretty soon is weld a steel plate across the front of that trailer because I've had issues before. If you cut a big log and you cut it crooked, it might have a stob sticking out of it or, or an uncut piece. And if you slide it all the way up, you can literally slide and, and go through one of those batteries. So I need to put a, a stop plate up there in front of those batteries, something I need to modify next time I'm over to welder guy. So little things that we're always needing to change and uh, adapt as we see we have a need for. I want to talk to you about one other thing. And this is just one of those lessons learned you see this pile of leaves and I throw these chains on it. This is kind of what it's like out when you're out in the forest and you're logging and you drop that old rusty chain down the leaves. You can't really see the chain. You will lose expensive equipment. So what I've started doing and I need to redo them again because y'all can see the paint's wearing is I paint the hooks Here's my shackles. They're painted a bright fluorescent color. Pick your color, just as long as it don't match leaves and, and bark. My snatch blocks. I've lost more than one of those over the years before I figured out that I need to start painting them a bright color that didn't match the forest floor. So you'll notice almost everything here 
has been painted. I often use this kind of fluorescent orange. It, it works. Fluorescent red, fluorescent green. Pick your color. You can paint them any color you want to as long as it don't match the forest floor. So think about painting all your equipment. Remember, that may look a little gaudy, but you're out there to work and you, this stuff is expensive. You don't need to be losing it. So paint it up real good so that it won't get lost. Then every once in a while, stop what you're doing and put another coat of paint on it, which is what I'm gonna do this week. Now, chain, I didn't talk a lot about chains. There's a lot of ratings on chains. Just cause it's a 5 16 chain or a 3 8 chain, doesn't determine the strength. There's a lot of different ratings on chains. Uh, you can buy 5 16 chains that's just as strong or stronger than a lot of 3 8 chains. So it has to do, they call them grades. I'm not gonna get in too far on that, but go and look at a grade chart on chains and you'll see there's huge differences in them. So buy chains that are strong enough to hold off stuff. But here's a few tricks. Quite often, to guide these cables or a log on here straight, I'll have to use snatch blocks. To use that snatch block, it, it goes around the cable. These things work like this. You put half of it on there and then close it back up and now it's trapped. So, what you, you've got it hooked up, but now how do you attach it to one side of the trailer or not? Well, I buy bulk chain and put a hook on it but notice this has only a hook on one end. And the reason for that is you've got to have a hook won't go through this hole, but a chain will. And I got this and I'll come over and run around this rail and then I'm, I'm rigged for controlling my log using a snatch block. Sometimes these chains are too short. So I made a a series of chains and what you'll notice about them is they've got a hook on one end but then they got a hook here that's short of the end there's about oh, 18 inches of chain hanging out of there and what that's for is this end of the chain would go around your trailer say I had this snatch block all the way across the trailer and that's where I needed to hold it then this This chain would go through my snatch block, come back and hook to itself, and then I can hold this thing, come across the trailer from where I am. So that's a made up chain, and it might seem funny, it's got a hook that's about 18 inches short of the end. That's so I can run this end through the snatch block. Notice this chain, I ain't got to it. Somehow it got skipped. I gotta get this chain and get it painted for you guys prove my point all right enough on cables painting <laughs> I don't know what else to get you on we went over uh, a lot of stuff on chains and I went over a lot of this chain stuff in a previous video and different types of chokers so y'all look back at that video and you can rather than me repeat it that's all in a previous one so there you go. That's how my trailer got to be like it is. There's my logging trailer and all the modifications I had to make to keep adapting it to the way I go out and log and move logs in here from out in the field. Uh, use the winches a lot. They sure do. The logs are just so heavy, you gotta have mechanical power to move logs. You just can't do it yourself when you start working on bigger logs. Uh, I may have failed to explain that, that I really don't do lumber, especially absolutely no construction lumber. I cut lumber sometimes for hard, hardwood where people make uh, cabinets out of or something else. Uh, special stuff, not run of the mill things. Uh, hardly any pine is cut up at all for construction stuff or even projects. Although I use a lot of pine and I'll, I'm gonna have a video coming out on that for forklift pallets and blocks and uh, stickers and a lot of other things you will need around a sawmill. I'll be going over how I do those and why and what each of them serve, purpose they serve. 
but uh, this is what I need to go out and do logging and it works pretty good. Most of the time I'm doing this stuff by myself. Occasionally I got helpers. Um, so everything's been geared to where I can run it by myself if I need to. So hope that was helpful in helping you figure out how you want to configure your logging trailer. Until next time, see you later. <laughs>